you know, when you die, uh, Chris, the molecules there are now composing your body, which is, you know, what does the word compose mean? So you are uh, putting together pieces by pieces, atom by atom, molecule by molecules. And when your body dies, you leave your body, the individual who is operating this body, and your body returns to earth. And it goes through a process of decomposition, which means breaking apart. And these molecules that make up your body will be now uh, reinserted back to earth. And if there is a tree nearby, the roots of that tree will absorb the molecules that used to compose your body. It will now return as a fruit. And someone would eat that fruit, and they're actually eating pieces of you. So we eat pieces of other people all the time. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I have my friend Giulio Cavaglio with me again, like last time. Um, again, if you are unfamiliar with Giulio, he is a practicing psychotherapist and an international speaker. So I am really happy to have Giulio on the show. Welcome again, Giulio. Hello, Chris. Good to see you again, my friend. What are you up to? Good to see you. So in this episode, I thought we would uh, go right for something that's that, that's a little out there for most people, but I think it's going to be a really, really interesting discussion because in our last episode, you talked a little bit about reincarnation from a Christian perspective. And, and most people probably don't think of reincarnation as something Christian at all. They think of that as something that comes from Hinduism or spiritualism or some kind of Eastern uh, spiritualist religions. But the from what I've found, there's actually quite a lot of evidence to suggest that reincarnation is taught in many places within the Bible. Have you encountered that or, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, that is true, Chris. Uh, you can definitely find the topic of reincarnation in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. However, if you're looking for the word reincarnation, you will not find it uh, because that's a modern term um, that was created long after the Old Testament and the uh, New Testament. But you would definitely find the concept of reincarnation, which is the same individual that takes a new body over and over again to continue uh, his or her progress. So that idea you will definitely find in the Bible. Now, uh, for those of you who are not informed, you know, what does the word Bible stands for? Well, the, the word Bible is actually uh, a collection of books, just like a squadron is a collection of airplanes. So that's what you have. It's a multiplicity of books, uh, which is summarized in just one book. That's what we call a Bible. And in the Bible, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what does the word testament stand for? Uh, the word testament means contract. So in a sense, the Bible is a contract between God uh, and his people. So you have the old contract and you have the uh, new contract. And the idea of reincarnation is found both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Okay. And you, you said that it's not, you don't find the word reincarnation. How is it expressed then, if not with that word? Okay. So in the Old Testament, uh, what you find is the idea of the same individual uh, being responsible for his or her own action. So to be precise, uh, what you have here is on Numbers uh, chapter 14, verses 18. This is what you have. So I'm quoting the Bible. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation. So what you have here on this quote, Chris, is the idea that the sin of the father is actually trans, uh, 
transferred to the son uh, on the third and fourth generation. Now, if we take this message literally, it means that whatever someone did, his grandchildren and great-great-children will be responsible for that. Uh, here again, we have to rely on the attributes that we have of God to actually interpret uh, the phenomenon of life. So what you have here is a God who is actually very unjust because he is punishing his grandchildren. He's punishing the grandchildren for whatever the grandfather did. I mean, how can a just God punish the grandchildren for the sins of the grandfather? This is a very unjust thing to do. It's similar of someone committing a crime and the judge actually forces someone else to go to prison for that individual's fault. Very unjust. The, the Bible actually prohibits the judges from doing that, I believe. In the Old Testament, it says that the sins of the father shall not be visited upon the sons, which is, a, I believe, a human commandment that a judgment of somebody um, in a, a place of political power is not to say that if somebody does something bad, then we're going to punish his kids for it, which is interesting that it's that they're they're both there. And it, they, at first glance, it almost seems to be saying exactly the opposite thing. That's exactly one of the things we advocated last week without the interpretation of the multiplicity, multiplicity of our existences, the Bible contradicts itself all the time. Uh, and, and that's a clear contradiction right there. So uh, the third and the fourth generation, it's not the grandchildren per se, but the same exact individual who comes back at his own grandchild or great, great child. Uh, and it's not the grandchildren who's being punished, but it's the same individual reincarnated that is actually going through the reaction of his own actions. So God indeed is very just, and the grandchildren is not being punished without a cause because the grandchild is actually the same individual who committed the crime that uh, was actually uh, the great great father. It's the same individual reincarnated in the same. Uh, family. It's the same bloodline. It's the same individual. The body is a new body, obviously, but the mind, the soul, the spirit is actually the same individual. Very interesting. So, so how do you think this ties in with the Old Testament concept of resurrection? That it seems to me that the, the there's quite a few verses in the Old Testament that suggest that People are going to, uh, when they die, they will be resurrected, that they will come back. But the way that it's written, it almost sounds like they're going to, their their body is going to be brought up from the dead. Uh, once again, uh, if we actually uh, study uh, Jewish tradition and Jewish law, and there are many different books uh, of the Jewish tradition, including uh, the Kabbalah, what you get is that the Jewish scholars, they believed in the uh, coming back of the spirit. That's what they meant by resurrection. You are reappearing uh, on earth. It's not that the same body, the same molecules that compose someone else's body and uh, will be resurrected from, from, from the earth. It's actually the same individual that reappears again. That's what resurrection stands for, the reappearance of an individual. But just let me open the parenthesis here, uh, because from the scientific point of view, I, I just love uh, this interpretation of seeing things. You know, when you die, uh, Chris, the molecules there are now composing your body, which is, you know, what does the word compose mean? So you are uh, putting together pieces by pieces, atom by atom, molecule by molecules. And when your body dies, you leave your body, the individual who is operating this body, and your body returns to earth. And it goes through a process of decomposition, which means breaking apart. 
And these molecules that make up your body will be now uh, reinserted back to earth. And if there's a tree nearby, the roots of that tree will absorb the molecules that used to compose your body. It will now return as a fruit and someone would eat that fruit and they're actually eating pieces of you. So we eat pieces of other people all the time. So in that sense, Thanks we are being resurrected. That. I mean, I remember that. <laughs> Next time I'm eating fruit. <laughs> so, so even in the material, materialistic sense, uh, uh, you know, there are pieces of us. They are eternal in that way because our bodies, molecules are made up of other people's molecules that have lived a long time before. But going back to the spiritual interpretation of this, that's what resurrection stands for, the reappearance of the individual and not necessarily uh, the same body that that individual used will reappear from earth in order for the individual to continue to exist. I see. And that was something that, that there, it sounds like there are some different understandings among the Jewish scholars. You, I mean, you mentioned that Kabbalah teaches that. Um, it seems like the, from, from what I can tell, the, at least the mainstream of Jew, Jewish thought in Jesus's day was that the material body would actually resurrect. Now, I'm sure in that time they didn't know what you just told me about the bodies decomposing and the molecules breaking up. Maybe they were, or um, either they were unfamiliar with that or they, uh, maybe they were like the Egyptians and they did a really good job of preserving the body so that they could maybe conceivably come back to life i um i wonder if you do you do you know much about the kind of the different schools of thought back then yes well um let's just refresh our mind why are we having this conversation are we having this conversation to actually prove that reincarnation is in the bible but that, that's not necessarily the point uh for the spiritist philosophy states that reincarnation is a law of life. It's not mm -hmm. a Christian belief. It's not a Jewish belief. It's not a, an Italian belief, a Japanese belief. It's a law mm -hmm. of nature. Uh, we reincarnate. That's how the law works. We have to come back as many times as we need in order for us to develop our intellect and our morality. Having said that, because it's a law of nature, we will find that natural truth in all different kinds of tradition, including the Bible, including the Jewish tradition and those who came back, who came after uh, the Jewish people, before the Jewish people, like the Hinduism, for example. Uh, Hinduism, it's actually one of these beliefs that it is so old that the scholars who study tradition, they say that they cannot pinpoint when Hinduism actually started. That's how old it is. And one of the uh, traditional uh, teachings of Hinduism, it's the will of samsara. And basically what that teaching says, Chris, is that everything that goes must come back. What you have here, it's the principle of reincarnation and the law of action and reaction. We are the architects of our own destiny and all the things I do, they come back to me. Okay, I gotcha. Do you, now, what about uh, what about in the New Testament? Because I'm curious about this topic because it seems so against the mainstream. I've I've never heard of any mainstream Christian or Jewish person, for that matter, that's out there saying that we reincarnate. Is that is that something that Jesus taught? Well, uh, it was also a common belief. Uh, between the apostles themselves. There is actually a passage, and uh, just to be precise, because we know there will be individuals who will listen to what we're talking, and they will actually uh, search for these quotes. So here, again, a quote directly from the Bible. Uh, to be precise, New Testament, Matthew uh, 17, uh, verses 12 through 13. And on this uh, verse, uh, Chris, what we find is that the disciples they are having a conversation with Christ himself. And they say, you know, we, we knew that you were supposed to come because this is what the prophecies 
have established. However, we were expecting Elijah to come first, but then here you are. And then Christ talks to them, and this is what he says. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. But they did not recognize him. They did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was uh, killed in a, in a very grotesque manner. Uh, he's, his head was actually offered on a plate. Uh, th this was terrible. And so this is what Jesus is explaining to them, that Elijah came, but Elijah was, ac was actually John the Baptist. So here you have the concept of reincarnation in the New Testament. Jesus is saying that Elijah, who lived a long time ago, actually was John the Baptist. Now, Elijah and John the Baptist were two different individuals uh, in, in history. However, this was the same spirit, the spirit of Elijah reincarnated and became John. So for those who are not aware of what reincarnation is, this is, has nothing to do with metempsychosis, the process of going back and reincarnating to an animal body. There is only progress. We can either remain stationary in the evolutionary ladder, or we can move forward. No such a thing as going back to reincarnate into animal bodies. So Elijah uh, died. Obviously, the body of Elijah died, and Elijah came back as John the Baptist, and the prophecy was actually fulfilled. That's very interesting for, for kind of for two reasons, because for one thing, we know that Elijah didn't resurrect in that his body did not come back to life because we know the circumstances of his birth. It, it says quite clearly in the Bible, actually, that, um, that, that who his parents were and when he is born was born, and even that I believe an angel came to his mother to tell her that she was going to have a son. So clearly this was a new body. This was a new form, a new baby that had come into the world. This is not a, a Elijah rose up out of his grave. Yes, this is definitely a, a clear-cut uh, concept of reincarnation. This is uh, Christ saying that John the Baptist is Elijah. Right. And they did to Elijah what they would do to Christ himself, uh, because eventually they would kill, kill Christ. Once again, for those who are not versed in the Bible, you know, what's so important about knowing what is a prophecy and the importance of a prophecy being fulfilled. Now, a prophecy, it's uh, something that it's going to happen in the future. So the disciples, they had this concern, you know, how do we know if, if Christ is the messenger that we were waiting for, the messenger that was actually uh, stated in the Old Testament that will come to help his people. So they're looking for things to actually find evidence that Christ is this individual that mm -hmm. the Old Testament spoke about. And one of the things that they could find uh, is that Elijah would come before this uh, very important messenger, which is Christ. That's what part of the definition of the word Christ, uh, the messenger, the Messiah, mm -hmm. you know, a messenger of God. And so they were concerned with this. And Christ himself, the Messiah, the messenger they expected, said, yes, the prophecies are correct. And Elijah did come. But he had another name, which was John the Baptist, the same individual into a new persona. Just to be clear for those who are not aware that this is all new to them, it's just like buying a new car. You know, you could change many cars in your life. You could have a Honda, Toyota, <laughs> a Volkswagen. You know, uh, th the cars are different, but the driver is the same. That's what the body is. The body is, a, it's a such incredible machine that gives us the illusion that we are the machine, but we're not this machine. We are driving this machine. So it's the same driver driving a different machine. So it's the, the same spirit, 
that drove the body of Elijah and now was driving the body of John the Baptist. Right, right. And, and it's interesting that the disciples understood it, that they at first they didn't know what Jesus was talking about, but eventually they, it, they realized it. And so that suggests that the disciples at that point understood the concept of reincarnation, right? Because his body, they knew that his body didn't raise up from the dead. And it also wasn't like he came down from heaven either. He was born as a baby. He was reincarnated. So his, his disciples must have understood that, which, which reminds me of another passage where Jesus heals a blind man. And it says very, very explicitly that this was a man that was blind from birth. And then the disciples ask him, was the man blind from birth because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And so clearly, if he was blind when he was born, he couldn't have sinned before that in the current life. It must have been previously, right? Yes. So the disciples, they they seem to kind of take it for granted, this concept of reincarnation, at, at least at that point. Well, um, on our last episode, we touched on this subject that if you are a teacher, one of the main things you have to ask is who is your audience? So if you're a teacher and you are at kindergarten, you know, who is your audience? Your audience are made up of you know, four-year-old and five-year-old. So although you graduated from college, the material you're bringing to these children is according to their knowledge. It's according to their capacity to absorb the material you're about to offer. You wouldn't uh, teach them college material just because you know inherently that they cannot learn college material. So these teachers throughout history, they taught us these concepts, and but many of them came up in very symbolic ways. And for the simple uh, fact that th the individuals who are learning this stuff, they didn't have the intellectual capacity to absorb the concept in, in a very deep way. Uh, a profound way. So symbols were given and, and just the basics, the ABCs of the concept was given. So the passage that you mentioned that the blind man, you know, did he commit a sin to deserve to be blind or were because of his parents that he was blind? Once again, you clearly get the concept of reincarnation right, right there, because if there's only one physical existence and that, and that's it, how would he have deserved to be blind for a sin that he committed when? When he was in his mother's womb? Because if there's only one life, that's when the soul is actually created. <laughs> when they are, when, when the mom is actually develop, developing a baby in her womb and the soul is being created at the same time. There's a whole line of argument that we can actually uh, work from from this premise because how many individuals believe that reincarnate that that abortion is the right thing to do because they're trying to say that a baby does not yet have a soul is just a messless clump of cells. I'm sorry, a soulless, a, a, a spiritless clump of cells that we are not killing someone, but rather just getting rid of 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 unwanted clump of cells. And, and that's right, because that's the reason uh, people, they believe that they're doing the right thing by choosing to abort a baby, because in their mind or in their belief, there is no soul in that clump of cells. You know, because there are even some people who claim to be religious, and they say, you know, I'm all for abortion because I don't believe there's a soul inside that clump of cells, you know, a blast of seal. question, how exactly do they know? <laughs> y yes, and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're, they're even trying to base their decision on religious teachings uh, for that matter. So when would that baby actually have the opportunity to commit the sin in order to deserve to be blind? You know, when the baby was in the mother's womb, you know, the baby actually looked at something that he wasn't supposed to look. And then he deserved mm -hmm. blindness. It, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Uh, I know the, what we're talking is not specifically about the passage itself, but the reason why uh, he was born blind, it was for Jesus 
to uh, perform uh, his powers. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say miracle uh, because the word miracle, it actually stands for you breaking the natural laws. And Christ, in the beginning of the New Testament, he says, I did not come to abolish the laws, but to complement, uh, to complete. So he did not break any natural law while performing what people called miracles. It's because he knew exactly what he was doing. Being a highly evolved spirit, he had the intellectual knowledge to bring healing to the physical body. And that individual was born blind, so Jesus could perform uh, one of his uh, spiritual techniques, and those around uh, Christ who was uh, witnessing his teachings could deduce uh, that Christ indeed was the Messiah they expected because no other people could perform uh, such actions like restoring someone's vision. That's very interesting. It, it seems to me almost like it would like the the passage would almost make more sense and, and this is kind of my theory but i'm just i'm just guessing at this but it would almost make more sense if the the prior passage was jesus explaining this concept of reincarnation to his disciples and saying that sometimes people are born with a disability like we talked about last time because they they committed some sin in the last life and they needed to learn uh, to correct their mistake in this life, or sometimes a parent will be born with a child that has a problem because the parent has some has something that they need to resolve in this life, and it, it would it would probably be both, right? Because it wouldn't be just for nothing that the 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 child would not be have a problem solely because of the parent, but it almost seems like Jesus was was teaching that to the disciples. And then the disciples saw this man that was born blind, and they asked him, based on what they had just learned, hey, is this, uh, is this a case of, of the parents needing to go through this trial, or is it him that sinned in a previous life? And Jesus clarified that actually it was neither one. It was for a different reason, which is, is very similar to the Spiritist teaching, that there's a, a whole host of different reasons why something might be the case why why you might have been born a certain way in this life there's a lot of different reasons that it might be of benefit to you and or the people around you yes uh the the reason is always a beneficial one depending on how we face that trial depending how we face that opportunity for growth uh, one of the reasons why it's a challenge for people to actually accept the, the this natural law of reincarnation it's because they're measuring everything from their point of view from the physical plane point of view but you see chris when we are in the spiritual plane and we figure that what life is all about is progress it's growth it's evolution and knowing that we choose our own trials and tribulations for our own benefit because we want to grow. So all these things that we label as difficulties and hardships, there is a benefit by overcoming these challenges. So we pick these moments, we pick challenges, we pick difficult people um, to, to reincarnate with. And, and once we are in the flesh, it's, a, it's a, the opportunity we have for us to develop ourselves. So we, we pick these trials ourselves. So the basic premise, if we are suffering, if there is pain, uh, we should never believe that this is actually some sort of an accident, or we're being neglected, or this is just bad luck. Either we have done something to deserve what we're going through, or we have asked for that trial in order for us to evolve faster. Now, some people would say, how in the world can you choose something like this? Well. There are so many analogies that one can use. For example, if you want to go to the gym and you want to grow muscles, you want to be in shape. Are you going to pick the lightest weight in the gym? Are you going to right. pick the, the, the lightest uh, uh, exercise routines? No, you know that that growth, you know the health and, and, and to build that physique, you're going to put yourself through challenges. Without breaking your own limits, there is no growth. Another knowledge one, one can use is going to college. If 
you're no, if you're fully aware that the purpose of going to college, it's for you to, there are many different reasons, but one of them is to guarantee a roof over your head, just to guarantee you living, your livelihood. Are you going to pick the easiest classes possible? Are you going just to party around and, and do anything with your college life? No, if you're serious about moving forward in life professionally to order, in order to guarantee your financial life, you're going to work really hard and you're going to pick the classes and the college routine that's very demanding because you note the outcome of that. It's, it's the byproduct, it's benefit, it's personal growth, it's professional uh, uh, victory. Same thing in the spiritual plane. So before we reincarnate, we actually get to make an analysis of the things we have done in our past. If we have this spiritual and the psychology, uh, psychological maturity, we make that analysis. And there are individuals that actually sit down with us and they say, look, these are the reasons you have failed. Uh, these are the, the reasons you have succeeded. And uh, based on this, let's make a plan for you in your next life uh, experience, in your next reincarnation. So who are you going to be born with? Who are going to be your parents and your sisters? What's going to be your social life, your social status? Which profession are you going to choose? Who are going to be your friends? Uh, what kind of trials you're going to face? Are you going to need any uh, disease along the way to actually make amends for stuff that you have done? So all these things, are, uh, we, we pick and choose based on our spiritual need. These are not things that we necessarily, we want. These are the things that we need in order for us to grow. And the same thing, you know, going to the gym. Uh, if someone tells me, you know, they are lifting 350 pounds of weight and they're happy about that, you know, they are not. They do it because this is what they need. And they know the byproduct, they get a, a better physique. I know it's a crude analogy, but this is where people get to choose something that is hard for them because they know there is benefit as the byproduct of that routine. Well, that, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, especially because it makes the makes the the trials of life a lot more meaningful a lot and probably a lot easier because if you take this this idea that yolo you only live once and your life is difficult well it's if that's the only life you have and you have this problem then that's that's pretty depressing right whereas if you realize that this is just a day in the gym and it's for your benefit and you're going to grow because of this you're going to be a better person because of this and you're spiritually you're going to be stronger and tougher and happier and everything's going to be better for you as a result of this well that that all of a sudden lightens the load a lot it, it almost makes it worth enduring don't you think <laughs> well i wouldn't say that it lessens the burden I would say that it changes completely how we see the burden. And then because mm -hmm. we change the perception, it also changes how we feel about the experience itself. Right. If I'm a big believer in YOLO, you only live once. Uh, so then what would be my life's objective? Well, to have pleasure. And how do we have pleasure? Through our material senses. And how can I get the uh, matter to excite this material senses. Well, I need money. And how can I get money? There are many different ways of getting money, including stealing, uh, trying to win the lottery. And if I only live once, do I really want to work hard, spend all this time working to get to the money? If I only live once, that means my time is very limited. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to spend on seeking pleasure not necessarily working hard. And, and if I don't have the money, what's going to happen? I'm going to be a very depressed individual. And right. one of the byproducts of being depressed for not having money is that I'm very angry at the people who get to experience material pleasure because they have money. Makes and sense. that's envy. And envy becomes a great source of misery. Uh, this is my personal customized hell. Uh, depending on the people that I know, the more 
I will make myself miserable. And all that, Chris, because of my perception of how I see myself thinking that this is just a belief system. And I'm going back to the uh, gym analogy. If I think that I'm only in the gym for just once, am I going to spend the day at the gym working out? No, I'll probably try to spend the day at the gym uh, trying to seek pleasure for the material senses as much as I want. I would not be working hard because I, I don't even know about what's the, uh, the real purpose of being at the gym, which is to uh, uh, develop my health, you know, uh, um, strengthen my immune system and all that. Uh, so I will waste my time at the gym uh, uh, seeking material pleasure. And meanwhile, the individuals who have the means to seek material pleasure, I'm very angry at them because I can't. That's envy. Envy, right. by definition, is when we are unhappy because of other people's happiness. Right, yeah. And, and I would say that probably those people think they can't. They have, I mean, if they have years of life left, then probably they could go make money if they wanted to. That's a, that's a good point. However, if you only think that you live once, and another effect of life for these people, and for all of us, for that matter, even for those who believe in reincarnation, is that in order for you to die, there is only one condition needed. You need to be alive. And nothing guarantees that we're going to die tomorrow. And the interesting thing is, uh, for those who have this YOLO concept, uh, some of the individuals, it's been my personal experience, they believe that death has a contract with old age. I'm only going to die when I'm 95 years old. Uh, and so they, they live this crazy life without preparing themselves uh, for the future. And, and hence, you know, they, uh, they, they live very miserable lives. Now, if you are someone who understands this natural law, that you come back here as many times as you need, uh, if you happen uh, uh, to carry yourself with this belief, that means you're constantly preparing yourself for the following day. And as a result, death does not really scare you. One of the uh, immediate results of truly understand the concept of reincarnation is that the fear of death disappears because now you know death is just a transition. You know, not, nobody dies. We just transition from the physical plane to the spiritual plane. We all continue to move forward. Uh, we all meet those we have love either in the spiritual plane or again in the material plane. So it, this concept, Chris, doesn't, doesn't lift the burden. It changes completely how we see the burden. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I like that gym analogy just because I've actually been kind of, I, I've always subscribed and I've, I've been working out for, for a long time. And I've always subscribed to the idea that basically when you go to the gym, you're supposed to completely exhaust yourself as much as you possibly can. And that's how you grow the most. I've recently been reading that that may not be true, that actually that that may be counterproductive. And instead, you should not go to failure and you should um, keep like stay lifting within the range that you're the strongest. And when you start to fatigue, that's actually when you should stop. You shouldn't push yourself further because you're just putting an unnecessary overburden on your on your body. And so I was thinking with the concept of reincarnation, we, we almost have the same situation where if suffering is an opportunity and that it makes you better, are you supposed to seek suffering and you're supposed to beat up your body as much as you possibly can and suffer as much as you possibly can so that you're making the most of your life and so that you're going to rise the most? Does that make sense or is, is that counterproductive? There were individuals in the past, Chris, that believed that actually cultivating suffering itself, that elevated the individual to a different level, to a different spiritual level. That's not true at all. Suffering for suffering does not create any evolution, any progress. When we know how to overcome painful situations, when we have the right perception of what hardships are, it's not that we're welcoming hardships and pain and suffering. It's our understanding of it 
changes uh, the way we experience it. It's not that I'm going to be happy if something bad happens to me. What I would definitely do, knowing and truly understanding that I have multiple physical existences, whenever painful happens to me, I would definitely avoid despair. What is despair, Chris? Despair, it's my belief that my tomorrow will be worse than today. And if I believe, Chris, that my tomorrow will be actually worse than today, what am I going to do today? I'm just going to go nuts. And, and this is where people commit suicide, for example, because the pain is so intense that they want to run away from the pain. It's a state of desperation. Now, if I know reincarnation, I'm not welcoming pain, but if I have to face pain, I, I face with resilience and I persist in overcoming that painful situation because I know that's not against me. I know that is to work on my benefit. Just the same way someone who works out in the gym, they are choosing the heavier weights because they want to grow their muscles. I am not at all an expert on this, but I believe the goal, whenever someone exercises, since we're going to keep on the analogy of going to the gym, <laughs> is that when you exercise, you, you're trying to break your muscle. You're stretching your muscle to, to almost breaking point. And, and that's, you do that by lifting the weights. And then you go home and you rest. And while you're resting, by eating the right food, by adding the right fuel into your body, uh, the proteins are being replaced, are replenishing the muscles that have been broken. And now you have a bigger muscle. So utilizing mm -hmm. this concept, you go through painful situations and hardships in life, and then you disincarnate. In other words, you leave the flesh. And now you are in the spiritual plane. Depending on how you have lived your life, this is the resting period of the gym analogy. And then you get all sorts of knowledge in the spiritual plane for you to better yourself in your next reincarnation. That's the nourishment in the uh, gym analogy. And then you go back and you're actually stronger than the day before. So you're actually wiser than the day before, than the reincarnation before you last. In the past, my understanding of reincarnation was that you you die and then immediately you're you're another person. You're born somewhere else. So you're saying that there's there's a period in between. It's not immediate. Yes, Chris, there is a period in between. And just like most things in life, there is no set rule. Uh, that there is no set number of years that you stay in the spiritual plane, because evolution depends according to each individual's own effort to move themselves ahead. But in, in, in a general way, one can say that we reincarnate once every 100 years. So we either in the physical plane or in the spiritual plane in the 100 years. Uh, some of you who could be uh, interested on this subject might ask me, you know, where are you getting this information from? Well, there is a whole collection of book books that we call the Andrea Luis collection. Andrea Luis, uh, Chris, he was a physician in his last reincarnation and uh, uh, he died. And he began after, after a couple of years in the spiritual plane and gaining all this knowledge of what life is all about, he began to write through an individual. And so he tells this story, he tells his perception and his experience of the spiritual plane from the physician's point of view. So he's bringing all this scientific knowledge uh, to us here in the physical plane of what the spiritual plane is all about. So this is called the Andrea Luis Collection. And uh, his first book, it's entitled Nosolar, uh, which translated to English means our home. I think uh, you can find that book in different websites, including Amazon. Okay. Yeah. And there's a movie of that too, which is, is very interesting. And it's, I mean, it's, I think you can get that on Amazon too, right? You can stream it. And it's very interesting. They have it translated into English. And so yes. I wonder, you're, you're talking about this interim period. And so I wonder how that 
that matches up to the concept of heaven and hell that maybe this spiritual plane really is what heaven and hell are referring to that the heaven is where the the spirits who have done a good job of their life or who have have good morality go and hell is the the lesser part of the spiritual plane where the the lesser evolved spirits go is that does that sound accurate to you hell and heaven it's not necessarily a geographical place but a state of mind um i worked in the jail system for 12 years and throughout those 12 years i actually uh, intervened in, in more than 22,000 cases i helped these individuals um i i used to see 10 individuals per day uh, chris a minimum of 10 individuals per day and it was very interesting things to see you know this was my uh daily lab of human behavior dealing with all those individuals for some individuals jail was heaven for mm. others it was hell now i i know it comes as a surprise for people to hear that jail was actually heaven because they immediately think of jail as being hell but you know and i don't even have to explain why jail is hell for a lot of people but for some people jail was actually heaven and interestingly enough those who considered jail as heaven was actually people who were deeply involved in a negative destructive behaviors and, and they knew that jail saved them from that behavior they knew if they had continued out on the street with that uh, uh, deep, strong of addiction, they will be dead through overdose in, in wow. a couple of weeks, if not days. So they saw jail as being uh, uh, an opportunity to be rescued. Rescued from who? Rescued from themselves. If someone have never dealt with the relative or with a friend who is addicted to drugs, you know, people who become addicted to a substance, they lose discernment you know what is discernment chris it's our ability to choose right from wrong as someone you know who is just seeking drugs uh, their goal is just to get high they could care less about being right or wrong so the discernment goes out the window and as a result they are putting themselves constantly in a very vulnerable environment and situations so when they go to jail, you know, obviously those couple of days of detoxing, it's actually hell for them. But then once the drug is out of their system and they begin to think clearly, they say, oh my God, I was rescued. I was saved. And this was the, actually the best thing that happened to me. I heard from so many people uh, this sentence. So clearly uh, for these individuals, uh, hell or heaven, it's not the place they find themselves uh, physically, but rather a state of mind. And the same goes uh, for the spiritual plane. When people leave their body, this is the process we call disincarnation. So let's first dis define these terms. First of all, what is reincarnation? We explained in our last episode, uh, the action of re-entering the flesh. So the suffix shan means action, the prefix re means again, uh, and then we have in, that's clearly means to enter and carne means flesh. So what you have is the action of re-entering the flesh. So the action of living the flesh, it's disincarnation. So when we go through a process of disincarnation, we are living the flesh. And now we find ourselves in the spiritual plane. And where are we going to be? Where it's not necessarily where are we going to be, but who are we going to be? And who are we going to be solely depends on our affinities, the people that we like to be with. So if I am a drug addict and I have committed a uh, suicide, indirect suicide through overdose, who am I going to be with? With other people who are drug addicts in the spiritual plane who have died of similar causes. If I'm someone who likes to work hard, uh, I love to study, I'm addicted to knowledge, if I disincarnate, you know, who I'm going to be with, with, with that same kind of group of individuals. So depending on how I have lived my life, that's exactly what's gonna to happen to me in the afterlife. 
There are no spontaneous changes. There are no uh, um, miracle mercies of some of somehow we experience the spiritual plane just the same way we have experienced the physical plane. If you have plenty of enemies, people who complain about you, you have this reputation of being mean and cruel to people, very selfish. How else can you be in the spiritual plane besides miserable and lonely and, 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 and going through all the emotions you have forced others to experience? If you have the reputation of being kind, uh, being helpful, uh, you're someone who people love to be around you and you know, and you disincarnate and everyone is crying because you, meet, you really made a difference in people's lives, obviously you're going to be well received in the spiritual plane. That will be your heaven, the way you experience these emotions. So in the book, Nosolar uh, by Andrea Luis, this is what you get, a description of what happens to people who have fulfilled their responsibilities and those who have neglected their responsibilities. And as a result, for those who have neglected their responsibilities, they go through a lot of pain, what others label as hell. But it's not a fire. There are no burning bushes or, or, or anything of that nature. And what you have are people who regret very tensely that they have wasted their life. It's like going to college and you waste your opportunity and now you see all the friends around you who are succeeding professionally and you have done anything. Uh, so th there is no one actually punishing you, but you yourself who uh, ask, uh, why in the world have I wasted my opportunity? So we are filled with regret. And, and if we actually have harmed people in the process, now we're filled of guilt. And we create our own customized hell. We live in an age of material abundance for a lot of people. They get customized cars. They get customized clothes. They get customized shoes and customized cell phones. We have our customized hells and customized heavens because it's what we have made our lives to be. Interesting. So it's almost like Dante's Inferno level. Uh concept where there's there's different people that commit different sorts of sins and they're all grouped together in their own different level of hell but probably even more individual yes chris uh in our physical plane is a reflection of the spiritual plane obviously it's a very poor reflection because the uh, spiritual plane that is the origin while the physical plane is the rough copy it's the draft uh, so what do we do here? You know, when, when you go to a concert, who are the people in a concert? These are people who are united for one objective, to be entertained. And their affinity, what connects them together, is the likeness for the same kind of music that the band is about to play. Uh, if you go to a conference of scientists, who are there? <laughs> These are individuals who are philomaths. They love knowledge and they are there to listen to a particular subject. So they are there for one goal and the affinity that brings them together, it's the passion for that particular subject. So that's exactly what we do in the spiritual plane. We unite ourselves in groups and depending, and, and depending what we like here, that's exactly what we're going to like on the spiritual plane. Now, we don't stay in these groups forever just the same way we don't stay in the groups forever in the, in the material plane. You know, in our teenager years, we get ourselves involved in sports. So our friends, they play the same kind of sports that we do. We dress alike and we listen to the same kind of music. But then uh, we go through this, dif these different phases of life in which we have different kinds of responsibility. Uh, we naturally walk away from certain friends. You know, we don't sit down and tell these friends, this is the last day I'm going to see you. It happens so naturally that we change our objectives. We change our passions. We change our motives. And suddenly we no longer have an affinity with that old friend from high school. It's not that we have became enemies. It's just because uh, we just don't sit and, and there is not much to talk about anymore because our interests have changed. Some of us have gained 
uh, emotional, psychological maturity, and some didn't. And as a result, there is no longer that affinity. So the same happens in the spiritual plane. We don't stay in these groups forever. Uh, it, it gets to a point that the pain and the suffering, it, it, it increases by the time until the pain of remaining the same becomes smaller than the pain of change. And as a result, we now want to change. We want to leave that group because we realized through our own experience that being who we are, we're not profiting from it. We're just bringing misery upon misery. And that's when we change. And this is a very important sub, uh, concept to understand that pain in our lives, it's not punishment by God, but a rough educational path that we have chosen out of our own stub stubbornness. That brings a very interesting perspective to hell because the, the traditional belief is that if you die and you have not met the standard, however that's defined, uh, then you go to hell and you're tortured forever. Whereas that seems like a much more reasonable thing that, that you go and you are in pain and you're suffering because that's the state that you've put yourself in. But as soon as you change, as soon as you get better, then you'll, you'll go to a, a better place. Which I, we could we could have a whole like two hour discussion just on that alone, which actually might be a great episode <laughs> for a, a future a future video. But um, I want to because we're we're we've been running for a while now. But there's there's a couple of topics I wanted to to go back to just because we're on the concept of reincarnation in the Bible, and one of those is I did a little research about just kind of searching on DuckDuckGo about reincarnation in the Bible. And the, the number one, I would say, argument against reincarnation from a, a biblical Christian perspective is a verse in, I don't remember where, it's one of the, the books of Paul, in which he says that a person lives once and dies once. But as he says pretty explicitly, the person lives only once and dies only once. Now, I have a theory about what that means, but I was curious if you had any input on that. Well, so let me um, connect these subjects together. Let's go back to hell here. Um, those who are strict believers in the Bible and they read it literally instead of symbolically, they would say, but you know, hell is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. And not, you know, with all the details created by the Catholic Church, but the concept is there. Now, Chris, once again, a teacher will always teach according to people's knowledge. So if I'm a kindergarten teacher, I would teach according to the children's ability to absorb the knowledge that I'm given. Meanwhile, I'm giving them the basis for very uh, hard concepts to understand. You know, when I teach someone one plus one, eventually I'm building their knowledge to teach them algebra. Eventually I'll be able to teach them physics and so forth w without teaching them, you know, basic math, the four functions, I cannot teach them the more advanced stuff. So the knowledge is always given according to the student ability to understand. So. Uh, back in the Bible days, uh, most of us, we were psychologically in our infancy. And as a result, the teachings were given to us according to our spiritual infancy. And telling us these moral concepts that I'm trying to explain to you, you know, it, it wouldn't jive with these people. That they wouldn't follow just because these concepts were too complicated for them to understand. So they were given strong images for them to actually be scared of. Just the same way when we talk to a two or three year old, let's say you have a very expensive laptop in your office and you don't want your son to go there. You don't want kids to go there. You, you might give them the cookie monster explanation. You would say, listen, you know, don't go there. There is a cookie monster. And if you go in there, this cookie monster will do something to you. So we are able to curb the children behavior because the child is going through the mythical stage that they believe in these sort of fantasies a cookie monster but if i'm telling this to a, a 10 year old you know don't go in there 
because there is a cookie monster, and he's going to laugh at my face because he's no longer going through that mythical stage. So mm -hmm. I have to give him an irrational explanation of why he can't do it. So the individuals uh, up to this day who are trying to help others to curb their behavior by giving them the explanation of heaven and hell have very little success. And why? Because they are giving them the concept of the cookie monster story. And um, people need to hear logical explanations. So the teachings of the Bible cannot and should not be interpreted literally, but rather symbolically. So there's another passage. We're going to talk about the one you discussed, but there's another passage in which uh, Nicodemus, uh, he was a teacher of his time. Uh, and he came to Jesus uh, and he says, you know, we, we all believe that you have to be the Messiah because no one can do the things that you can. And then he asks Christ a, a question. So let me quote directly from the Bible for those who want to uh, know where we got this information from. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So here we have the concept that we cannot be born again if we're not born out of water. Traditionally, Religious people have interpreted this passage that to be born again is actually to get baptized. This is what people did in the past. Uh, people were splashed with water. Some of them actually bathed in a nearby river in order to be considered uh, baptized. Uh, uh, even Christ himself was baptized by John in order to fulfill the prophecy. Uh, but to be born out of water, Chris, it's not to be baptized. You see, a man's sperm is made up of 60% of water. A woman's egg is roughly made up of 70% of water. And when that, when they become together and, and we have fertilization of the egg and that becomes the zygote, the zygote is like a droplet of water as well. And we, in our grown-up bodies, we have approximately 69%. We are made up of 69% of water. So to be born out of, out of water is actually to have a new body. Uh, so going back to the uh, passage from Paul, Paul says that the Spirit has one life. It's true. Paul is not lying. The Spirit has one life. We, we just have one life, the spiritual life. Our physical existences are many. Two different things. You know, there is only one individual that is right now temporarily under uh, the persona of Chris. When that individual stops to being Chris, that individual is the same individual that have lived millennia before. And it will be the same individual who will be, who will live uh, millennia after. Actually, you are immortal. You do not die the spirit so the spirit has one life and we will never die we are immortals but our physical existences are many so there's nothing contradictory in paul's statement okay yeah i i had i've heard that explanation before but i had a, a bit of a different one i can you know tell me what you think about it but um, because he says specifically that a person lives once and dies once and so the the spirit is immortal the spirit never dies so my interpretation of that was that chris shoop lives once and dies once this this body lives once and dies once because you got to think about the context historically that he was talking to people that that followed the jewish tradition and the jewish tradition believed again in resurrection they believed that the body would would die would live and then die and then resurrect and then die again and resurrect and die again right so it sounds to me like he was really referring to that that's what he was trying to 
clarify is that no the the body the your me chris shoop right now with this particular body and this particular name and this particular identity is only going to live once and die once and then when i'm reincarnated in the future with a different body and a different name and a different identity then that person is going to live once and die once does that make sense it makes all the sense uh here again we get even through your interpretation the same concept that uh the spirit lives once yes that's the spiritual life and our persona only lives once now for those who are not familiar with the concept of reincarnation uh it's not that you become a completely new person in your next reincarnation you are the same individual what do you mean by this you know your values your intellectual capacity uh, the cultural baggage that you have, all these things are the same, except a new body. Uh, the analogy of the car is perfect. You know, it's the new, it's a new car, but the driver is actually the same driver. You know, if you buy a new car and you have an old insurance with some points in your driver's license and some uh, driver habits, just because you didn't, you bought a new car, it doesn't mean you become a new driver. <laughs> it's the same new driver, in a new machine, nothing changes. What it changes, it's the machine and not the driver. Right, it's Obviously, just a little confusing when you talk about it because if I, if I refer to you, Julio, am I referring to you and your current existence and your, your identity as Julio or am I referring to the immortal spirit that is you and has probably had many names? That's an interesting question. So in the spiritual plane, how do we present ourselves? So let's say, so we, we die in, in different time. Uh, 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 you die very old and I die very young. And who are you going to meet in the spiritual plane? If I am still in the spiritual plane, if I haven't reincarnated yet, I will present myself with my last reincarnation. Or if I'm already an evolved individual, I'm not saying highly evolved, but I already know what life is all about and I'm working really hard to become a better version of myself. If that's the case, Chris, we have the ability to actually uh, choose the persona we wanna be. Uh, so we will actually pick a reincarnation that was very uh, definitive for my spiritual transformation. So I'm just throwing numbers here. So let's say, you know, I have lived 100 times and it was actually reincarnation 73 that I, that really changed my perspective on how I'm going to live my future existences from that point on. So when I'm, whenever I am in the spiritual plane after that reincarnation, I actually choose uh, that appearance in order for me to uh, present myself to others. So this is, this is more a question of statics, uh, of, of, mm -hmm. of preferential statics in the spiritual plane. It's no general rule, um, but the individual it's the same in that sense what i mean by individual you know the spiritual knowledge the intellectual knowledge the, their cultural baggage these are the things that remain the same and it's going to become a very it's going to be a surprise for a lot of people to say that whenever you're finding yourself in the spiritual plane once again there are no immediate transformation i could disincarnate as a catholic and in the spiritual plane i will remain a catholic I could disincarnate as a Muslim in the spiritual plane, I'll continue to be a Muslim. And reason being, it's because there are no immediate changes. There are no spontaneous transformation just because we see ourselves in the spiritual plane. This is actually a topic for another night, but a lot of people that when they are in the spiritual plane, they don't even know that they are in the spiritual plane. So they continue uh, for some good time thinking that they're still in the material plane. Very interesting. And yes, so that could be a, a very broad topic itself. So I think we'll wrap up here, but I want to ask everybody that's listening, what did you get from this? Did you, do you have any further questions? I mean, to me, again, this brought up a ton of other questions that we could go into. So what caught your interest? What would you like to learn more about? And the um, same as, as we talked about last time as well, I'd like to, to, ask people 
if, if you disagree with something that we said here, and a lot of people will, right? Because what we're saying is very much going against uh, the most of mainstream Christianity, right? So if if you do disagree, please let us know. We want to hear it. And for me, particularly, I, I can only speak for myself, is that if I'm wrong about something, point it out. I want to know. Like, tell me that I'm wrong if you believe that I'm wrong. But just don't just say that you're wrong. Say why. Like, what for for what am I missing? What exactly? Because I, I've seen this. I, I get this occasionally when I, I make a video about something like this, that people will say, don't listen to this guy. He's a false teacher. And it's like, OK, maybe I am. But that's actually that's a big responsibility on my shoulders. I don't want to lead anybody astray. I don't want to be a false teacher. So if I am, if I am doing that, please let me know and please tell me why. But if you're just hurling accusations with no explanation as to why, it's it's just not helpful at all. So um, that's that's my final request. And uh, anything anything for you to add, Julio? Yes, sir. Uh, that was uh, thank you for those um, those words. Yes, we ask you to criticize us, but wisely. Uh, don't make any comments. I mean, you can make any comments you want, but uh, the value of your comments will be based upon the uh, uh, how uh, abound you are to uh, adding intellectual uh, and, and a productive conversation to what we're saying here. One of the reasons why we don't hear much of reincarnation uh, in the uh, Christian and, and Catholic and Protestant religions, for that matter, that's because, Chris, uh, the Emperor uh, Constantine, back in the year 313, remember, we are talking about a period in which the state dictated which religion people were allowed to profess. And the Roman Empire, you know, if you're a Christian, you know, you could be executed for being a Christian. And this emperor, one day, he was about to have a battle, and he sees in, in a symbol, an image. He, he sees the cross, and he hears a voice with this message, you will win the war, and he did on the uh, famous bridge of Melvin. And this is the year 313. From that day on, this man declared that Christianity was actually allowed to, to be taught, to be preached, to be followed in the Roman Empire. This is big, Chris. This is very big. But if there is something that we cannot force upon people is religion. So what happened? What you have, it's the uh, primitive Christians who taught a very different kind of Christianity we see today. And, and they merged with polytheism, the belief in many gods. Believe it or not, Chris, you know, the uh, statue of Zeus was melted. The statue was made of gold. That statue was melted, and they made the statue of Peter, the apostle, with the same gold that, was, that, that came from the statue uh, uh, of Zeus. And, and why is this? That's because you cannot force religion upon people. So instead of actually absorbing pure Christianity, they fused these two ideas together, the uh, primitive Christianity with polytheism, and, and that gave rise to Catholicism what we see today and many versions of that. The thing is, this, this emperor, uh, Constantine, he was married to Theodore. And, and Theodore, she used to be uh, one of these uh, women who uh, were uh, in, in charge of many uh, prostitutes of that time. And the only reason they are female prostitutes is because they are male prostitutes. So she was in charge of these uh, prostitutes, and they all became very angry uh, towards this woman. It's a very long story, but in short, you know, she married with the emperor afterwards, and she actually asked the emperor to remove from Christian teachings the concept of reincarnation. So the, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, which was the official religion of that time after the uh, after the uh, uh, Emperor Constantine claimed its tolerance towards Christianity, have no official document stating that there's no such a thing as reincarnation. So it was because of this woman, Theodore, uh, back in the year 325, uh, he, there, there were a gigantic meeting, 
uh, with all the religious leaders of that time, and the concept of reincarnation was was removed uh, from the Bible. And they have the uh, canonic books and, and those who are uh, apocryphal books, books that were not included in, in, in this collection of books that we call the Bible. So many things took place, but you know, in the concept of reincarnation, which is our discussion, this is one of the reasons why the reincarnation was not taught uh, so blatantly after this incident. So having said that, uh, thank you, you all for your attention, and we hope to hear from you so we can continue a conversation with your participation. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Julio. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon, my friend. Have a good week. You too.